Welcome to the Career Meets World podcast, Josh. It is such an honor to have you on today. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Really a pleasure to be with you. So look, we have a lot to cover today because you have one of the most unique backgrounds that I personally have ever heard about. And the truth is you started your career as a jazz guitarist. How does that happen? (laughs) <laughs> well, so I grew up in the city of Detroit, not the suburbs, and uh, I just love music. I, neither of my parents were musicians, but I started learning piano at age eight, quickly shifted to guitar. And I had an early guitar teacher that was like, you know, I mean, I, I just want to learn Stairway to Heaven so I could impress the girls. But he's like, look, if you really are serious, if you learn jazz, there, there's no more complex form of music. If you can play jazz, you can play anything. And so I started learning jazz and I actually fell in love with the art form. And so I got super serious about it. Like I, when I was growing up, I would skip parties and hanging out with my friends so I could practice all night. And uh, I, I just took it very seriously. I, I started playing in local wedding bands and sneaking into bars when I was a teenager. I played in a Detroit University's uh, college jazz band when I was in high school. And then at 17 years old, I skipped my prom and skipped my graduation and zipped off to the Berkeley School of Music. So to, even though I don't do this professionally today, I, I still play regularly. And again, it's a deep passion point for me. So oftentimes those types of stories really help you launch your career. You jump into interviews and write. That's a really good story to tell. What do you think being a jazz guitarist really taught you and you take away today? Well, jazz is a really cool art form to me anyway. I know that not everybody likes to listen to it. It's a a bit of an acquired acquired taste. But the cool thing about jazz is that 99% of what you play every night is made up as you go. It's like real-time innovation. And so if you and I were in a jazz combo and we played the same song every night for 10 years in a row, in a row, every night would be different. And jazz is very much like a conversation, just like we, we're not scripted today. We're just kind of riffing off of one another. And that's exactly what jazz is. And to me, it's this beautiful thing because you're creating, you're composing and performing simultaneously. And there's a little bit of danger to it. You're taking responsible risks. You screw stuff up inevitably and you have to course correct. And it's this cool thing too, where you shift between listening and supporting others to shining in the spotlight yourself and back and forth. And so to me, I think it was actually was the best teacher I could have had becoming a, an entrepreneur because those are the exact same skills that you need today, certainly in business. Absolutely. And I know that a lot of our listeners at some point, including myself, has played some sort of instrument. I used to play the clarinet when I was younger. And I think it teaches you a lot about how to converse and free flow and have these types of conversations. And it's afforded you quite an interesting career. And I'm hoping that for those who might not know you, if you can kind of expand on where that led you afterwards. Yeah, so I was also, besides being a jazz musician, I was a bit of a tech nerd. I, at, at age, uh, let's see, maybe 11 or 12, I wrote uh, what's called BBS software, which was the precursor to the internet on an Atari 800 computer with 64K of memory. So we're talking old school. But um, anyway, I kind of dug technology. I wasn't really that great of a programmer, but I was kind of a tech nerd. And uh, at age 20, I decided to do something crazy, which is start a tech company. And P.S., I'd never taken a business course. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know what a P&L statement was. But I said, well, in jazz, you figure stuff out as you go. And I said, maybe I could figure this out too. And what happened was I saw an opportunity where I could mail order individual hardware components from catalogs, assemble them in my college apartment, and sell them as a completed computer system uh, on campus. And so my first company was born. I made tons of mistakes. I screwed up a bunch of stuff. I just figured it out as I went, ended up selling the company before I graduated. And I really, you know, I was bitten at that point by the entrepreneurial bug. It's really interesting to see how you basically took that experience as a jazz musician, basically layered in to the entrepreneurial landscape, but you started multiple companies since then. And I think every single one was a little bit different. What do you take away from that first kind of venture capital experience or just venture in general, where you had to piece things together and you didn't necessarily know exactly how to do it. What do you learn from that? Well, that gets back to jazz, which is, you know, you, you figure stuff out, you just get thrown into these bizarre situations and you have to navigate. By the way, that, that creative confidence doesn't come from thinking you're going to do it right. It's quite the opposite. It's knowing that you're going to screw something up, but having the, you know, sort of abilities and competence to course correct and adapt during the inevitable setbacks. And so that's what gave me the confidence, I guess, to proceed in business. Um, This first company wasn't Google, like it wasn't a a giant success, but I learned a lot. You know, I learned, I made a bunch of mistakes and, and continued forward. And then sort of each subsequent company, I took on a little bit bigger opportunity. So in 1995, I started a company making websites. And, and nobody knew what a website was. I, it's so funny, man. I would, I would call people up and say, hey, you want to be on the internet? And they're like, well, what's the internet? I was like, yeah, I could build you a website. I'm like, yeah, what, what's a website? And I'll never forget, I was saying at the time, 
two percent of companies would have a website and at that time it didn't take a genius to figure out that pretty soon everyone would need a website and so i got into the internet that was early 1995 believe it or not and in 1999, I started the world's first interactive promotion company. So instead of doing internet advertising, which most people at that time were focused on, I focused on digital promotions. So I think the other theme, besides just sort of throwing myself into the fire, is a willingness to do something that was counterintuitive. I could have, in other words, been like 684th internet advertising company, but I chose instead to be the first interactive promotion company. So that, that I think has also been a theme for me. Maybe it's coming from Detroit or being a jazz guy, but I like to sort of stick my finger in the eye of conventional wisdom. I like to balk tradition. You clearly have done that multiple times and you kind of carved out your blue ocean for yourself. I know that there's a lot of kind of resemblance with what's happening today as well, right? The pandemic has kind of completely shifted how we operate online and there's this new creator economy. And I think a lot of younger folks are stepping into it as well. What would be some of your recommendations to people who are early in their career, have this entrepreneurial tenacity as well and really want to step into that field? Well, I think it's you know, kind of like what we do in jazz is, is you learn from the masters, you learn the mechanics and you learn your craft you know, to the point where you really have the substance and depth to, 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 to be, you know, professional. But then there's a real magic in breaking the rules. You know, some of those that I admire, not only in business, but in music are those that, you know, knew the rules. It wasn't that they ignored it, but then they purposely chose to do something opposite. So if someone who's listening admires a YouTube star or a podcaster, yeah, study it, learn what they do, learn how they interview and ask questions, but don't just replicate. There, there's, I think the real, real opportunity lies in originality. And so it's, you know, studying others, but then finding your own voice. Absolutely. I think authenticity in general is key and it's what's going to differentiate you from everyone else. Because the reality is if you replicate everyone, you're not going to stand out at all and nobody's going to find you on the internet. Look, you, you've done what, about five companies. I think all of them were slightly different. What did you realize after your fifth company in terms of starting businesses about yourself? Obviously you mentioned you had no idea how to start a business. What do you learn at the end of kind of going through your fifth company? Well, a handful of things. I mean, first of all, you know, I look at the leader that I was back in the day and I cringe. Uh, I was very paternalistic. I felt like I needed to protect people as opposed to being transparent and open. Uh, I feel like I tried to um, uh, you micromanage as opposed to give people creative freedom. Uh, you know, so I think over time you develop your leadership skills. I mean, the things that I, I know now that I wish I knew then, uh, you know, first of all, when you're an entrepreneur, the, the, the highs are very high and the lows are very low. You know, you win some account and you feel like you're on the you know, champion of the world. And then you lose some account and you feel like you're, you're you know, bloodied in the street. And what I think you learn over time is that there's a real natural oscillation to it. And so eventually now my tolerance is like, I don't think the highs are so spectacular, nor do I think the lows are so catastrophic. You just sort of understand that, you know, that it, it cycles back and forth. You know, the other thing that I learned is that, you know, many people say, First, I'm going to start focusing on what I do, and then later on, I'll focus on who I am. In other words, you focus on your product first and your cultural values second. And we're actually just getting a new company going. And right now, what are we focusing on is the core values way ahead of the, um, the, the, the products, because the products are, are going to shift and change and adapt it over, over time. But that fundamental you know, sort of cultural underpinnings. So here in my business now, we have this sort of, I call it the OS 14 or, or our 14 step operating system. And there are these little catchphrases like one is um, uh, commit to five Xing, which is when you are doing a value exchange of any kind, like let's say someone buys something from me and I give them something in return for it. Am I delivering a clear cut five X value? Because if you're delivering five X, then your customers don't shop for a new alternative. They don't question your price points. It's clear that the value is there. And that can apply to internal communications as well. Another one we, we have, um, we'd say is um, don't forget the dinner mint, which is the notion of that, that competence is no longer a competitive advantage. That's the anti to play. So if you have a good product and good service or whatever, so does everybody. Of course you do. But then the question with don't forget the dinner mint is a strategy of can you plus up a piece of work product? Can you add a little extra surprise and delight, a little extra creative flourish that makes your offerings stand out? So again, we, we focus, long story short, on, on the cultural underpinnings. And by the way, these are attributes that I interview for. That every single uh, time we do a performance review, the entire conversation is based on these principles. So they're not just platitudes that let, hang in a lobby. They're, they're sort of a system uh, for behavior and decision-making that we live by on a daily basis. 
I love all of those, especially the last one with the dinner men. Uh, it really highlights the importance of this white glove service notion. I know that oftentimes you're keen on hiring or leadership or what that looks like, but how do you really personally grow? How do you invest in yourself? What do you do on a daily basis or on a yearly basis, the way you break things down to really make sure that you're constantly growing and evolving? Well, I'm a big fan of famous quotes. I had them plastered all over the walls in my office. We had 500 people. So there was a lot of office space. And some of them are like, some of my favorites are, um, uh, if, if you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance even less. Like that one's by General Eric Shinseki. There's one called a uh, Chinese proverb. Um, it, uh, man who says it can't be done should not interrupt man doing it. I've always loved that one. Um, but there was only one quote of my own personally that I put on anything. And I said it so often that people just get sick of hearing me say it. <laughs> and the quote was simply this, that someday a company will come along and put us out of business. So it might as well be us. And I apply that quote to answer your question directly personally. So I like, in other words, someday a version of me is going to put me out of business. So it might as well be me. So I actually take a really proactive uh, attempt to every six months or so, put the Josh of six months ago out of business with a new version. And the way I do that is I focus a lot on inputs. In software engineering, they say, if you want to change the outputs, you got to change the inputs. So I'm constantly learning, reading. I just love like absorbing both sort of germane content and even weird content, just because it, it adds to your overall, you know, basis of, of, of understanding. Um, but I spent a lot of time in reflection and planning and, and I try to be pretty deliberate about putting myself out of business. And I think it's an important thing for us all because the world is changing so quickly, you know, like we're living in a rate of change like none other in history. So even if we achieve success at some point, personally, we can't just simply rely on it, assuming that that's a permanent state. It's more like, okay, that's great. Let's spike the ball. But now we got to say, all right, What's next? What's the next version going to look like? Put yourself out of business. I love it. So look, you, you've done so much work on yourself, on your businesses, on your employees. And recently you actually wrote a book. What inspired writing a book at this point and what's kind of the core of the, and the meat of the book itself? So yeah, thank you for asking. I'm very proud of it. It's called Big Little Breakthroughs, How Small Everyday Innovations Drive Oversized Results. It was actually my fourth book all of which are on the topic of what we've been discussing, sort of human creativity, entrepreneurial thinking, creative problem solving, et cetera. And, uh, you know, it's based on not only my own experiences as an entrepreneur and a jazz musician, but I spent over a thousand hours in research on this book. So I, academic research, neuroscience, et cetera, but I also personally interviewed people all over the world, CEOs, billionaires, celebrity entrepreneurs, Grammy award-winning musicians, and more importantly, probably lots of everyday people just doing really cool stuff. And the whole pr principle of the book is it's sort of like innovation for the rest of us. It's not for Elon Musk. No offense to Elon Musk, but <laughs> this is for normal people like you and me. How can we inject creativity to drive better outcomes? I like to say I try to help everyday people become everyday innovators. And so the book, it's not about taking these wild, high risk, irresponsible moonshots. It's about cultivating small daily acts of everyday innovation, micro innovations. And when you start applying the principles of creativity to the little stuff in your life, it makes it way more accessible, way less risky while you're building these critical skills along the way. So I think it's a much more pragmatic approach to harnessing creativity for productive results. I love that. And I know you spent so much time putting this book together because it's not easy to cultivate something so great. Who were some of the most interesting people that you interviewed during this process? Well, the cool thing is, so I didn't interview like the people that everybody always writes about. So I didn't tell the story of Netflix or Apple. I mean, they're great, but we already know they're great. Like we get it. So I tried to find surprising stories. I tried to find things that were fresh and that's where it got really interesting. Um, I interviewed uh, this guy named Trowin Restrick. This is one of my favorites. So uh, it turns out that in, in probably in San Francisco where you are too, but in central London where Trowin lives, cigarette butt litter is the biggest environmental problem in central London. It's besides looking bad, it's terrible for the environment. Small animals can ingest them. They spend millions of dollars a year trying to clean it up. No success. So enter Trow and Restoric, who's like, you've never heard of him. I never heard of him. And he doesn't wear a $4,000 suit. He wears crinkly, wrinkly, khaki pants and 10 year old loafers. He's like an average everyday dude. But he, he saw this problem and decided to do something about it. So he invented something called the ballot bin. And this is, here's what it, how it works. Let's say you and I were just finishing our fish and chips in a London pub and we walk out into the street. And we're about to throw our cigarette butt lit, litter on the ground until we see off in the distance, this bright yellow metal box. 
and our eye is kind of drawn to it. And we walk over and, and at the top of it, there's a two part question that says, which is your favorite food, pizza or hamburgers? Or which is your favorite sport, the Grand Prix or US Open? And, and basically there are little receptacles, there's a glass front and it encourages smokers to vote with their butts. So if I like pizza, I would put the, my cigarette butt underneath their pizza is because there's a glass front, there's a metal divider that votes for pizza, the butts stack up on top of each other. So it looks like you're basically two side-by-side -side bar graphs. And here's the cool thing, this is low tech, it didn't require millions of dollars. It didn't require 14 PhDs. It didn't require, you know, titanium materials. This guy put this together himself, but, but it worked. In fact, when ballot bins are installed, they reduce cigarette litter by 80%. And so Trowin went on to start a company. He's got 55 employees. These are now in 27 countries around the world. So I love uncovering stories like that because for me, I look at Elon Musk and say, good for him, but it's hard to see ourselves in that. But when I look at Trell and Resterick, I'm like, you know what? I could have done that. You could have done that. And so that's what this book is really about. It's about using the principles of innovation, how normal people can enjoy outsized results by, by applying these principles in real time. Thanks for sharing that story. I love it particularly because it's simple. And again, anybody can actually go, not necessarily replicate, but emulate this process, right? Innovation is about following a process and staying consistent. And I think you and I never necessarily want to aspire to be Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos, but the truth is we can live an incredible, impactful life by actually providing a ton of value to people. And you're doing that consistently, whether it's through your book, through the companies that you run. How do you really think about a daily structure? Because oftentimes, People who are hyper successful, who are having tremendous impact in the world, and I view you as one of those individuals, how do you actually go about and structuring your day to make sure that you not only balance yourself, your company, your family, but really make sure that you're continuously growing? Uh, awesome question. Um, well, in the book, anyway, I, I cover, I, if you were to zoom out and say, okay, I want to learn anything new, <clears throat> whether it's innovation or gardening or learning to play the flute. You, you need to take a look, all right, what are the mindsets that I need? What are the tactics that I need? And what are the habits that I need? So again, in the book, I sort of unpack all of those in a really sort of easy to understand way. But what you're talking about essentially are the habits, which are what do you, what do, you do on a daily basis? How do you structure your time? So I'll tell you a couple of things that I do. Um, and I put a lot of thought into this, by the way, but it's always changing. Like I'm sure two years from now, I'll have you know, tweaked it or whatever. But a couple of things that I do, one is I do a five minute a day. That's right, five, that's it, five minutes a day, a creativity uh, warm up every morning. And it's so easy, whether it's someone, I'm happy to share it with you, but it's like the simple thing that just sort of sets me up for 16 hours of continuous creativity. A couple other things that I do, and I'm happy to get back to that though. Um, I learned this from a friend who's a fellow author named Neil Pashrika. And he basically says, listen, normally in a week, let's say you have five days, 40 some hours, and they're scheduled with a, a smattering. Each day looks kind of the same. You got some meetings, you got some phone calls, you got some projects, and, and but but they all look the same. So the problem is to do deep creative work. When you have 11 minutes to your next conference call, it's really hard to do. So his suggestion, which I embraced, is he, he created something called an untouchable day, which I've now done for two years, where he says, don't, don't work more hours, but smush all the meetings and such into four days and, and carve out one day to be quote unquote untouchable, where you have nothing scheduled. You remove for yourself from social media, you don't check email, let everybody you know need, needs to know about it. And that's the time where instead of being heads down, doing transactional to-do list type work, you can be heads up and you can do the deep thinking that, that sometimes requires more time. So I do that once, one day a week, I've been doing it now for two years, single biggest boost to my creative productivity uh, in years and years and years. And the only other thing I'll say, and I'm happy to get back to that ritual, by the way, is I also spend at least an hour a week reflecting. And most people don't do, you know, we're so caught up in the whirlwind, we're getting our stuff done, you know, but I really take the time to sit back and say, how was last week? What did I learn? What am I going to learn next week? What, am, what do I, what do I want to improve? What am I going to focus on? And so I do take a pretty deliberate approach to scheduling and planning both, each week, both reflecting back and looking forward. So many nuggets of wisdom there. I feel like if you haven't done this already, you should probably write a post about this or maybe even a longer form blog post on those five secrets. But I think in those untouchable days, if we can expand on that, what does that look like for you? What are you actually doing throughout that day? So it depends on the day. I don't necessarily make it the same every week. Usually, in fact, it's different because I sort of say, what's the highest priority thing that I need to do? And so a lot of the book that I wrote, this, it was during untouchable days. Um, now I might be working on new fresh content, 
Uh, I'm working on a couple new business projects. And so sometimes those things take four or five, you know, deep focused hours that you can't do just smushed in between meetings. So basically what I do is just decide, okay, what am I going to do? Like this week, my, my untouchable day happens to be Friday. So before Friday, I'll say, okay, I've got like this 10 hour block. What am I going to do with it? And sometimes I'll say, I'm going to break it into thirds. Other times I'm going to say, I'm going to work on the same thing for 10 hours. I do try to break it up, get a little bit of exercise. I'll try to get a little bit of sort of breathing and I'm not deep into meditation, but a little bit just to be grounded. Uh, I try to eat real healthy that day and I try not to drink anything the night before. So I have a good night's sleep. And I really try to make that as sacred and productive as possible. I love that. So there's, there's so much going on in the world right now. And I know a lot of people are either looking for jobs, they're mid career, they're trying to make pivots. You've had this interesting lens into the world. You've led multiple companies, you've worked at different places, you've had a ton of opportunities. I love asking this question, which is what is the advice you truly give to your 23 year old self today, knowing everything that you know now? Well, I was just at lunch with my 21 year old daughter and I actually do have a 23 year old son who works at a tech startup here in Detroit. A couple of things. I mean, first of all, there's no better time to take risk than that age. So instead of just saying, oh, you better go become a management consultant or something, I, I say to my kids, I'm like, look, now is the time to try stuff before you have a burden of responsibility. And one of two things are going to happen and both of them are good. Either you're going to try something and win spectacularly and then, you know, you get to pick out what color Ferrari you want or you try something and it doesn't work out spectacularly and you learn a ton. So you basically either going to win or you learn and both of those are really good outcomes. So I think it's a perfect time to be trying, uh, trying things. But the other thing I think is just that, you know, let's not you know, embrace the dogma of the past, whether it's a parent, I'm sure well-intentioned parent or teacher or whatever, you know, be, you mentioned the creator economy. There's so many opportunities that exist today that didn't even exist a year ago, let alone 20 years ago. So I think let, each of us should be, should take it upon ourselves to, to, to sort of chart our own course. And finally, I would just say, I said this to my daughter today at lunch. I said, don't think of making a decision in, in the sense of permanence. Think about it in terms of chapters. So she's starting in, near you in, in San Francisco in August working at Amazon. I said, hey, think of that as a chapter. And that chapter might last a year. It might last four years. It might lead to another chapter. It might lead your whole career. Who knows? But don't, don't put the pressure on yourself to commit forever when you instead you can think about it as an experiment. So experimentation and constant learning is probably the best thing you can do at that age. I hear that so often and reinforcing it from somebody who's seen so much success is really critical. Josh, what's on the horizon for you now? What are you looking forward to over the next 12, 24, 36 months? Well, a number of things. Um, I, I remain a passionate researcher on human creativity. I just love finding stories and sharing them with the world because you know, it, it, it gives everybody that little bit of a boost. Let's, let's unpack it. Let's figure out how it works so that we can say, gosh, I can demystify it. You know, the, the thing that's funny to me, and I know this might sound like a postcard, but I, I really mean it for my soul. The way I look at it, there are 7 billion people walking around this planet with a dormant creative capacity, me included. I'm not fully tapped and I'm sure most of us are not. And, and the thing is that the answers to our most pressing challenges lie inside of us. In fact, when you study history, the, the breakthroughs that we celebrate all originated with human creativity. And, and the research is so clear that all of us have this capacity, but we don't all necessarily fully leverage it. And so I just feel like I'm on, on this mission to help people bring that creativity to the surface, not for the sake of it, not to draw all over the walls with purple crayons, but, but to drive pr productive outcomes. And those outcomes could be career outcomes, they could be family or health outcomes, they could be community outcomes. But the things that we all care about, the, the, the outcomes that we care about the most can be solved if we bring enough creativity forward. And that's, that's kind of what I feel like I'm on a mission to help people do. I love that. So I guess as we continue this discussion, there is just so much going on right now. And there's people who you and I often don't necessarily serve, but I want to make sure that we address this because there's this whole conversation going around about just equality in the workplace or just how people kind of work together through different cultures, different ethnicities. How do you approach that within your own company? Because I know that's a big part in creativity and fostering great culture. What does that mean to you? Well, when I think about diversity of all types, uh, I think there's a double thing that's good. One of them is that we absolutely, for the right social and moral reasons, need to embrace diversity, period. Like, like there's no one that should be making an argument 
that's contrary to that. And that to me is diversity of all types, diversity of, of age and gender and sexual orientation and you know geography and height and like, like there's the, all of the above for sure. And, and just let's let, be honest that, that we have had, even though I don't think it's always been intentional or, or malicious, but there certainly is systemic racism and a systemic um, lack of equality, again, across all of these different uh, uh, sectors. And so I think we, we just owe it to ourselves and our children and our, our world to, to do the right thing. Putting that aside, the moral arguments, which are clear, if you're just talking about productivity for a second, if you just want to be really pragmatic about it, diversity drives performance and diversity absolutely drives creativity. I mean, I play jazz guitar. If I was in a band with 13 other guitarists, that would be awful. It'd be wretched. In that case, diversity of instrumentation is a good thing. But when you look at, at, at companies, it always breaks my heart a little bit when you have a team of 15 people, they all look and act and sound just like the CEO. Like there's nothing wrong with that person like that phenotype, but, but let's, let's bring others to the mix. And you see study after study that creativity is better and, and creative outputs are better when more diversity is embraced. So I think we, it's a double win. We should do it because it's right. And we should also do it because it's more productive. I had a feeling that you're going to tie in the jazz analogy. And I appreciate that. Uh, look, Josh, I thoroughly appreciate everything you just shared right now. There's so many nuggets that people can take away. And I want to make sure like every single one of our guests, we, before we let you off the hook, we throw you into our hot seat and make sure we ask you a couple of fun filled questions. So are you ready? I'm ready, man. This is awesome. Let's do it. All right. So Josh there, like we talked about, there's so much going on right now. And I want to make sure that people understand how you truly and deeply think. So if you had to invest in three companies and hold for the next 10 years, what would those companies be? And again, this isn't intended to be financial advice. This is more around how you actually look at the world going forward. Well, so as you know, I already, I, I like non-traditional approaches. So some people would say, oh, let's go look at the stock market and blah, blah, blah. I would look for three brand new companies and I'd still do invest in, in, in startups. And I look for people that are taking this non-traditional approach. So I don't think I would say, oh, choose Tesla and you know, eBay or whatever else. I think it's more about you know, discovering what's, what's next, what's on the horizon. You, know, you mentioned the creator economy. I think there's wonderful opportunities there. I think there's wonderful opportunities in cybersecurity because that's obviously a continuing issue for our world. I think there's wonderful opportunities in sustainability and that's certainly you know, ethnic diversity, but also you know, planet-based sustainability. And so for me, I look at what are the macro trends and then what are those people that are coming up and taking a non-traditional approach that ends up creating a better outcome? And I know it's sort of like a, a generic answer, but I can't pinpoint a particular company. I would rather back a person or people or a team that is going about tackling a big problem in, a, in, a non, in an unorthodox way. Even those verticals themselves are really critical. So finding a space within there is a really good place to look. Question number two for you, and I ask this of everyone, if you and I were to take a jet and go out to New York City, we get to go to Times Square, and you literally can have an unlimited budget, put whatever you want all over Times Square, what would you write? What would your message be? Hmm. First of all, I'd take you to the Village Vanguard, which is a great jazz club on 46, <laughs> right, by, right by Times Square, but, um, uh, which we'd have a lot of fun with. Um, I think that the messages that I would want to share are number one, that all human beings are creative. There's no such thing as a non-creative person. You know, we're hardwired to be creative. That's our natural state. And by the way, that can show up differently. Like some people paint art on canvas. Some people do interpretive dance. Some people are creative lawyers and dentists and such. So I think the first message would be number one, we're all creative. And number two, that we have this resource inside of us. And if we bring it to the surface, we can, we can just make the world a better place. I mean, I, I, I often think about, um, what would a 5% creativity upgrade look like? And I'm in Detroit, as I mentioned. And I say, okay, what if my whole community here in Detroit was 5% more creative? Just think about the disproportionately high outcome that might create for education or public safety or racial justice or you know, fill in the blank, career, community, environment, et cetera. So I think my message would be more of a call to action that let's all think of ourselves as creators and innovators. And I think in turn, we make the world a better place. Perfect answer. Last question for you is outside of your family, who are the three people that inspire you the most? Uh, do they have to be living or just anybody? Either. Um, well, one person that's inspired me a lot is uh, John Coltrane. John Coltrane was a jazz saxophone pioneer and his most famous work, funny enough, is called Giant Steps. 
Mm-hmm. And the reason I won't get all techno geeky on you, but in music, especially jazz, there's sort of a structure that you follow. It's called a harmonic structure or organizing the way chords flow. Giant Steps, he literally went as far away from each of those instructions as you could get. That's what's called Giant Steps. It's literally the furthest mechanical distance that you could go from what was prescribed. And so it was the, by definition, the most wonky structure and it became his greatest hit, if you will. And he changed music as a result. So I admire that. I admire people who are willing to like really shake things up in a bold, provocative way. So that's one that I admire greatly. Um, I think, um, uh, you know, it's, it's hard. I mean, I, I think you, you have to look at people like Dr. King who, who gave their lives and their livelihoods to make the world a better place and, and to end, you know, bigotry and suffering. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know how you wouldn't want to, you know, hang out with, with Dr. King. Um, and then I think, you know, to me, I, I, the last one, I'm sorry to cop out on you, but maybe it's like that unsung hero, the Trowin restaurants of the world. And it's not just Trowin, but it's the thousands of other people who are using their creativity to do amazing things. One of the people I wrote in the book are these um, chemistry students in, at UC Santa Barbara who invented a way to preserve the peels on fruits and vegetables. Turns out that 40% of the world's food supply is wasted because of spoilage. And meanwhile, one of nine people on our world go to bed hungry every night. And their technology now called Appeal Sciences uses the materials from plants and vegetables. They, they found a way to spray it on, all, not all organic, non-chemical, and it extends the peel length by three to nine times. So a strawberry might last a month and an avocado might last six months or whatever, which is making, will, will make a dramatic impact in, in world hunger. So when I see people like that, it's not just them, it's not just Trowin, but it's that category of the unsung hero that, that's not a celebrity, but they're using innovation to, to make the world a better place. Those are the ones I celebrate. I feel like you hang out with some of the smartest people in the world. And look, you survived the hot seat. I appreciate you sharing that. I want to make sure that people are able to connect with you, find out where you hang out on the internet. What's the best way to reach out to you? And what is the title of your book again? Yeah, so the title of the book is Big Little Breakthroughs, How Small Everyday Innovations Drive Oversized Results. Um, I would love to connect with anybody. If I can be helpful in any way, I, one of my mottos is give generously, don't keep score. So seriously, if I can help in any way, don't even hesitate for a second, but check out biglittlebreakthroughs.com. Uh, if you want to buy the book, obviously you can get it. But but besides that, there's a bunch of free stuff there. There's a there's a, a creativity assessment. There's a quick start guide. There's downloadable worksheets. So think of it as your innovation toolkit. It's free, nothing to buy, and 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 that's a good spot to, to check it out. Uh, and if you want to connect with me on any social channel, just my name at Josh Linkner, which is spelled L-I-N-K-N-E-R. Beautiful. Make sure to check out Josh, go to his website, make sure you utilize his resources because as you just heard, this man has so much wisdom and has so many good things to share with people and he does it purely out of generosity. Josh, thanks for hanging out with us today. And as we always say at Career Meets World, go unleash your wildest potential. Thanks so much. I love it. Thank you. Really appreciate it.